All right. Jill, do you want to go ahead and? Uh... Absolutely. All right. Hi, everybody. We have to stop meeting like this. We miss you. We miss you being in our museum. And it is ready for us to reopen in a couple weeks. Uh, thanks for staying on this journey with us, all about virtually. Uh, we've been really happy with the participation we've received through our Facebook Live uh, segments, our virtual visits, our field trip Fridays, our moat visits. Uh, we've been trying to, we've been keeping very busy and trying to make sure that you all out there have something fun and something to take you away from the news of the day, which is not good at all and to take you away from your binging on Netflix and what other channels you're, you're choosing to watch. And we appreciate the fact that you're choosing to spend an hour with us. And shout out to our production crew, which is vast and expansive, <laughs> Aaron Muir. <laughs> Yay. He is a phenom on the turning us into a, vid a virtual museum. And Brad for stepping up his game and giving us all kinds of history every day of the week. We really appreciate it. And I uh, look forward to the open conversation tonight, Brad. Take it off. Take off. All right. So welcome, everybody. There's still some more people adding on, which is awesome. Um, so whoever wants to unmute themselves and fire away a question, we can, uh, we can get things going. Or I can, maybe I'll just, uh, I'll start with Elaine Schulberg had a question last, during our community views last, um, last Wednesday, asking about the population of Tavernier during the 1935, you know, I listen to this, I listen to 1930, 1940 area. So I found a, a, a 1935 census of the area and I counted all the people in the Tavernier area, which included Plantation Key at that time. Uh, they were considered part of Tavernier, and there were 209 total people on the census with 75 different like head of households, 75 different you know, families. So the total population of the Upper Keys in 1935 was about 650. So about a, a third, around a third, a little less than a third were living in the Tavernier area. Elaine, I think you need to unmute yourself. I see your lips moving, but I can't hear. There you are. You you were saying the one guy, um, I can't remember his name, I wrote it down, but was a um, land developer. So, oh, and, I, I could, and I could see off in the distance like a track home, Trek Holmes from in one of the pictures you were showing. So that's why it, it spurred my interest to how many people were actually there. Yeah, so it was, you know, you know Tavernier, the downtown Tavernier would be on, on Key Largo area, kind of where Mariner's Hospital to, you know, uh, Chad's Bakery kind of area, um, like mile marker 91 to mile marker 92-ish. And um, a vast majority of the 209 total people would have been kind of in that in, in that relative area with a, a you know with a number of them living in plantation on plantation key as well. Okay. Okay. All right. Who else has a question? Hi, Brad. Hey, Mary Jo. <laughs> Welcome from New Jersey. <laughs> Where are you at? New Jersey. All right. Um, hey, I have a question in regards to the camps um, for the workers of the railroad. Like where were they were located on the islands? The railroad workers or the World War I workers? The railroad workers. Uh, well, the World War I workers. There were, I think, like 89 camps between Key Largo and Key West at any one time. Mm -hmm. uh, there would have, I'm not sure where on Upper Matacumbi Key the, the, the camps were set up at. Um, they would have been like all temporary kind of, I've seen pictures of, of the camps, but I, I, I don't have any reference to the area of where it was. How about for the railroad workers? That was for the railroad workers. I, I'm sorry. Railroad workers. 
for the World War I veterans during the construction of the bridges, um, there were three camps. There was one on Windley Key, kind of in the area of where Island Grill at the foot of uh, Snake Creek Bridge. And then there were two on Lower Matacumbi Key. One uh, like kind of where Robbie's Marina is today and one where the Boy Scout camp is at, at, at the end. Oh, okay. I just wasn't sure where they, where they were really placed on the islands and I always found it interesting to know. Yeah, well, kind of weird because there's there were five work camps the designations and uh, camp one was Windley Key, camp three and five were on Lower Matacumbi and then two and four were like somewhere else in the state. I'm not sure how they got their numbers, their, their <laughs> numbers together. Yeah, I was, yeah, I was reading that Storm of the Century, so I was I like to place it. Excellent. All right, who else has a question? I have one. Phyllis Mitchell, is that you? Yep. All right. I was out uh, shopping out of sheer boredom today. Got out with a girlfriend and uh, went to lunch, but I, they, uh, one of the t-shirt shops has a, uh, a, a new line of uh, t-shirts that uh, have a historical bent to them, which surprised me. Um, if that's a new interest in history, that's a good thing. But uh, they said Ala Morata was, uh, uh, established in 1907. That's a good one. Comment on that. And yeah, 19, 1906, 1907 was when William Crome, who was one of the engineers with, with Flagler, purchased uh, 15 acres of property um, from the Russell family. And he, and he uh, created 22 lots and named it the home, the uh, town site of Isla Morada, which is kind of where the post office is today and the De Leon Avenue um, and US One kind of area right there. There used to be a, a there, there used to be a grocery store there like 20 years ago called Townsite, and that was the reason they chose that name Townsite because that was the original town site of Isla Morada. I remember that. I remember that store. Yes, I, I do too. <laughs> yeah, one of my daughters worked there one summer. All right. Uh, other date that I saw on a t-shirt was 1514, as if uh, the keys were discovered in 1514. What's that? Was it 1513 or 1514? I, I could be wrong, but I yeah. 15 and I, I thought in Spanish. Well, 1513 corresponds with Ponce de Leon and him declaring the island chain Las Martyrs. Um, and he, was not the, he's given credit as the first person to chart the Florida Keys. Actually, he was probably the, I don't know, fourth or fifth person to do so. Um, there were a couple of, uh, of, um, of um, uh, European map makers who were, who, who charted the, the area used based on reports and from other mariners who had been in the area. Um, what's really kind of weird and it's kind of happenstance um, uh, occurrence was one of the first to chart the island chain. His last name was actually Martyrs, M-A-R-T-I-R-E-S. Um, and then Ponce de Leon, 1513 visits, and he does chart the, uh, you know, chart the Florida Keys, doesn't call them the Keys, calls them Los Martyrs, you know, because he felt the islands looked tortured because of the, uh, the skeletal white, you know, bone nature of the of the limestone. Um, I w I would think that the Florida Keys would have been established thousands of years earlier, with the uh, when the water kind of receded, and about you know six thousand years earlier when the island chain was actually first established. But uh, that that date would correspond to Ponce de Leon. That's the popular story taught in history classes. Not necessarily the accurate one, but a popular one. So, oh. yeah, ge geologically, I mean, how were the keys formed? You know, was it a peninsula or the, something to do with it? Yeah. The Florida Keys are really an ancient coral reef. So that's why they're all limestone. And when you, uh, it's all based on limestone. And when you dig deep or, not, or, you know, not very deep, there's lots of fossilized coral reef corals 
in, in the limestone, we had, there's a local park um, called Windley Key Fossilized Coral Reef State Park that used to be a quarry that Flagler utilized during construction of the railroad. And they still have some, some eight foot high exposed walls. And you can really see how the, the corals as they, the, the fossilized corals there. And the fact that it's a chain is just because of the currents coming into the Gulf? Yeah, um, if, if you look at a map, there are two kinds of, of coral, coral reefs out that they're called um, patch reefs and they're called spur and groove reefs. And the spur and groove reefs are kind of like, I described them like a, like, like a comma at the end of a sentence. So you have like a series of commas. So there's currents that go between. So you kind of have a series of reefs, um, like corals and then kind of sandy area and corals in a sandy area. And that's called kind of a spur and groove formation. And then a patch reef would, you look at a map, like if you look on the map of the keys, the lower keys look more like a spur and groove formation, especially down the Saddle Bunch keys and those areas down mile marker uh, 20, 10, 20, 30 down, or 10 and 25 down there. But then up in the upper keys, if you look at like Plantation Key and Key Largo and the Matacumbi keys and Windley Key, it's just one solid block, which is more indicative of like kind of a patch reef. But yeah, it's, it's the other question, go ahead. Question I had, you know, you're talking about um, 100 years ago history. When did Key West get electrified? When did electri electrification come in? First electricity. The phone service. Uh, first, for the first electricity, like 1890, 1898, somewhere in that area. So early. Yeah, that was the earliest. And then it didn't come up in the upper keys really until uh, 1930s area. But Key West was the largest city in Florida for a long time. So it was, it was well advanced for Florida, which was really a frontier in the 1800s. Huh. Right. Who's next? Uh, Brad? Yes. Uh, Ellen from um, Oshkosh, Wisconsin. Thanks, Hello, for sharing, Ellen. thanks for sharing your time. Um, Brad, on Carroll Street, um, kind of back behind the Islander, um, years and years ago, there it was a cistern was discovered there. And I know that there was a lot of, to do about, you know, that it was not a buildable lot and we need to preserve this. Could you, do you know any history on that cistern? I do. And that property recently sold and the owners um, were nice enough to build their house well away, well away from the cistern. So it, kind of is remaining there. It is a huge <laughs> cistern. Um, it was developed by the Pinder family as a pineapple packing plant. Um, I think uh, 1910 area, era, I believe, somewhere in that area. Um, and then it closed down after the pineapple industry kind of went south. Um, they closed it down to refit it as a tomato packing plant, but it never reopened. And then when the 1935 hurricane came, it kind of destroyed, you know, everything. And that was, and that, that was never really de developed again. I know the kids growing up in the, you know, 50s and 60s and 70s used to hang out there to do what kids do when they hang out. Uh, I heard one person say they used to roller skate in there. Um, I'm, I'm not sure how accurate that is. But that Adam, was my parents roller skated there. Oh, excellent. Fantastic. So was it, was the cistern underneath the packing house or how was, how would that have been? How does the cistern relate to what was formerly the packing house? I, I don't know the exact how it was. There was a couple smaller buildings. I'm not sure if, if in, in many instances, the cistern was beneath the, the building. I'm not sure how that structure was laid out. I know there were several buildings in the, on that place. They were packing, you know, and 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 um, and can and canning. They were going to can tomatoes. I'm not sure. I know that I've heard stories that after the 35 hurricane, there were lots of lots of cans that, that were left. There were you know, unused cans that were kind of blowing around. But I'm not sure the configuration of of that uh, of that property. I only know for sure that it was going to be a, a, a pineapple processing. It was used for pineapple processing. 
and then it closed down to be refitted for tomatoes. But I don't, I'm not, not sure how. I, I do have a history of it done by Bob Carr, um, and there may be some information there. I'll, I'll have to recheck to see if he gives uh, any more information. Uh, Brad, the yes. the current the current owners are they thinking they're going to leave it there? Are they thinking they're going to tear it down? Have, has there been any talk about it? I don't know. I just you know just, just watching the house <clears throat> the house being built, and I think they did remove I think they did remove part of the wall or one of the walls. I mean this mostly most cisterns. I want to say you know. We look at them maybe 10 by 12, 10 by 15 feet, something like that. And this one's like 20 by 40 feet. It's really tremendously large for a cistern. Um, and it, it looks like they have an eye towards history. I've, I have no idea. I've never, I've never met them or heard, heard any discussion that they were, that they worked to preserve it and not to, not to uh, demolish it during the construction period. Cause there were some bulldozers and things moving things around there. And, um, so they did, they haven't, I haven't walked back there in a month or two. Uh, it's just like three properties down from the Islander. And um, it's a really cool old, old structure. But I'm not sure what their plans are. Uh, hopefully they'll, they will remain, they will continue to remain, um, you know, with, with an eye towards the, the history of, of that property and let it stand or incorporate it into some other manner on, on their property. That help, Ellen? Uh, yeah, thanks. Um, and, I, and I bet that our president of the Keys History and Discovery Center might be able to have a chat with that owner. And I have a feeling he had, would have a good influence on that owner keeping it in place. Yes. I would agree. Brad, did I misunderstand you or did you say the pineapple industry was kind of wiped out by the storm because of the different, the change in the soil from the acidity or? There were several factors into why the pineapple industry kind of went awry. There were a series of hurricanes, 1906, 1909, 1910, that um, did have some, uh, some storm surge. And they talk of a pineapple blight and to me, that sounds like salted, salted earth that was no longer able to produce the quality of, of pineapples. Mm -hmm. but, the bigger, but the bigger problem for the locals was that when Henry Flagler built his railroad, he, um, you know, his, the train went to Key West, but from Key West, it, the, the railroad cars were packed onto an, a ferry and, and delivered to, to Havana, where they were packed up with fruits and, and sugar cane and, and things, and one of the fruits that was imported were pineapples, and the local the local farmers could not compete with the prices that were um, offered in Havana because Flagler charged them a lesser tax rate than he did the local farmers in the Keys. Uh, so also, okay. Also, the pineapple industry, you know, it, it was it was dis disrupted by hurricanes, and um, but also they they couldn't compete with the uh, they could not compete with the, the Cuban farmers. And from that point, a lot, in, in, in many instances, key limes, which could still, uh, were still a very viable crop, you know, as well as oranges and lemons and tomatoes and cucumbers and, and all, and, and a pretty surprising list of, of, of things that were being farmed in, in, the, in the Florida Keys. But pineapples kind of went away. Because the Cuban would have had the same storms, but maybe their soil was different or something. They, well, I they know. have, I think, much more soil. You know, our soil here in the Florida Keys, it's based on a coral reef. And, you know, if you try to garden in your yard, that, that top level of, of, of topsoil is, you know, sometimes an inch or two, an inch or two thick. And those nutrients would have been, you know, used up pretty quick. Um, but one of the cool things about the, the limestone and one of the, benef one of the reasons it was so beneficial to the pineapple industry was that when the water... Uh, mixes with the limestone, it produces phosphorus, which help, which, which would also help to, to uh, um, energize and 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 and, and, um, and help grow the pineapples. 
neat fact. Thank you. You're welcome. Brad, in your research, have you ever come across the rationale for why Flagler favored uh, foreign countries in his tax rates on moving goods? I'm, I'm not 100% positive, but, I, but I, I remember, I think I remember reading that Flagler, being the industrialist that he was, knowing where he, that, that he wanted to go not just to Key West, but to Cuba, invested in some Cuban farmland as well. So he had a, an interest in those. In, in, I, I'm not positive about that, but that's in the back of my mind. I think I read that somewhere. And would that seem would certainly make sense. Brad? Yes. Did Crum, when he platted the um, lots from the land that he had purchased, did he sell them and make money from that? Or? I know he, pl he platted 22 lots. I think he paid seven hundred and forty nine seven hundred and thirty nine dollars for all all fifteen acres. I know there were several uh, other engineers that were kind of involved in the deal, and I don't know. Um, I know he built a house for his family, uh, for himself, and there were several other engineers who built houses for their families. Um, but I'm not sure what the what happened when he sold his interest. I'm, I'm not sure about all that. That's a really interesting idea and, and a really cool subject to look at as to how that part developed. And that's something I'll, I'll definitely look into. And my only other question is, was Hausman buried on Indian Key or is that just rumored? Because I remember... He went to Key West. He went to Key West and... Um, August, September, October-ish, 1840, after the attack on the Indian Key on August 7th, 18, 1840. Um, and he did, he was killed during a boating accident. And the story is that his wife brought his body up to Indian Key and buried him on the island. Um, I know for a fact that she did uh, commission a, a large marble um, headstone that was placed on Indian Key. Um, there's no record of his body ever actually coming up here. And, you know, so uh, it, it may have been a symbolic burial. Um, what's, and, and when he was killed, um, he was crushed between two boats. As he was going from boat A to boat B in, in stormy weather, he was, you know, got a kind of caught in between and his, his midsection was crushed. And in 1960, there was a, a skeleton uh, discovered on the island after Hurricane Donna, I believe. And, and that skeleton did have a crushed pelvic area, but there were several bodies buried, buried on that island. And I don't know, no one knows for sure what happened to his body. Um, but this, but and if his wife bothered to get a big, you know, eight foot, marble tomb, grave, you know, gravestone uh, probably came from Charleston, was probably shipped down from Charleston, could very well have, could very well have ha happened that way, but no one knows for positive. Um, if, you know, if, if, you're, you know, if your proof is that it, it only happened if someone saw it happen, um, then no one will ever say definitively that his body was buried there, but Either, either symbolically or physically, he was buried there. So at least his spirit was buried there, at the very least. What happened to the marble headstone? The marble headstone was destroyed uh, by treasure hunters in the 40s and 50s. Um, people who were on the island looking for buried treasure, they used a lot of dynamite. Uh, it ended up being broken into about 27 different pieces. There was a historic group out of Coral Gables who came and rescued the uh, headstone and took it to uh, Miami Coral Gables area where it was stored for about 25 years. Currently, it was then brought back to Lignum Key, which is another island in that area, um, where it was safer because there are park rangers who live on that island who were, are better able to watch, you know, take, uh, keep an eye out on the, on the gravestone. So it sits in 27 pieces on Lignum Vitae Key. And um, they, 
did ask us that the the parts the park system did ask us if we were interested in housing that tombstone here, which is definitely on our plans for the, our next our next fiscal year, um, to bring that headstone. And we've developed a really cool uh, a really cool um, exhibit to to showcase it. And that's one of the things that we're hoping to accomplish this year is to bring that here. We do a lot of history of Indian Key. Um, my cousin Doug is asking this question. Indian Key is my favorite island in all the Florida Keys. And to have more of, uh, I consider Hausman's gravestone one of the, you know, premier artifacts of Upper Keys history. And to have that here at the museum would be amazing in my estimation. So we're hoping that, you know, in the coming months that we'll be able to, uh, to, to realize that that hope of, of bringing the, um, it's already been released to us by the state. So the state's on board and it's ours for the taking. So hopefully we'll be able to bring that here and, and keep it safe and to share it with, with our community and our visitors. We just Any need thought of putting it together again? Oh, it's in, it's, it's, it's in 20, 26 pieces. It's all put together. But um, it's like a puzzle. You know, some of the pieces are the size <laughs> of a cantaloupe. Some of the pieces are the size of, of you know, um, a rack of ribs, kind of, you know, it's bigger and smaller. And it, 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 it'll definitely be taken apart piece by piece and then reassembled here. Sounds like a conservation project to me. <laughs> yes, but I, I think I'm very worried. Well, right, it, it's been sitting out just, just on, the, on the lawn living by the key for like 25 years. Right. So uh, to have it inside and you'll cleaned up and, you know, and, and, per, and preserved for, you know, for, for the future would, would be awesome. I happen to know a conservator. Excellent. <laughs> she just might be related to you. I was about to say, is her name Lisa? <laughs> <laughs> she just might be. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Did Big Year start his um, rubber trees over there, or is that just fiction on Indian Key? Did I'm sorry, what? Was Goodyear on the island of Indian Key and started rubber tree plants here because of Perrine, or am I mixed up? Um, there was the Goodyear family was on Indian Key. Um, they, along with the Howes, were one of the, the few, like one of one of two uh, groups that stayed after the attack and remained on Indian Key. I know the the, the Goodyears opened up a uh, um, a grog house on one of the wharves and made a pretty good piece of money selling booze to the sailors and, and other people passing by. Um, it was, it was not, and the Goodyear's is the namesake of Goodyear Tires. And I believe it was one of the sons who was not in this area who perfected the vulcanization of rubber to create tires. But he, that Goodyear was not on Indian Key, but members of his family were. So the, the vulcanization um, issue was done somewhere else. I want to say New York, but I don't know. That's just, I'm not positive about that. Perrine's big thing was um, Cicel agave, um, and uh, the other one was mulberry bushes. Because mulberry bushes um, were the primary food source for the silkworm. And, and the mulberry bushes grew very well, and for the creation of a, uh, of, of harvesting silkworms to create silk. That was one of his other big initiatives for commercial, uh, commercial sale. Thank you. You're hey, welcome. Brad, I'm gonna give something a try here. I've got the video, the short little video um, that you created showing the um, Houseman tombstone. Oh, cool. I've got that pulled up. Um, so I'm gonna try and share my screen here really fast with everyone. I'll grab Let's a beer. see if it will work. Hopefully, you'll be able to hear as well. I don't oh, know yeah. if that's going to work, but you can at least see it. Oh, cool. I'm actually saying very clever things and being quite historian esque as I'm measuring and talking about the, uh, the marble slab and where it's going to go. Because you can see that it's in, you know, it, it, it's 27 pieces, but it's it's fit together pretty well. I All right. It's eight feet long and like five feet wide. Cool. Good job. Well, that was really neat to see. 
I love when technology cooperates with us. It doesn't always happen, but when it works, it's great. Good job, Mira. Thank you. Vic, you have a, uh, all right. Brad, did, yes. did the um, Parks Department approach you, or did you approach the Parks Department? Because I think it's pretty special that they've chosen our facility to, to um, display this. Yes, they, um, we've developed a very good relationship with the parks, with the parks people. Um, and they, they recognize my slash our love for Indian Key and how much we promote the island and what we've done for the, with the walking tour, the app that we've created and, and, and the model we have that, that, that we built of the island, how it would have looked back in the 1840s. So they, you know, were very enthusiastic and they, they approached us and said, are you interested? Because where it sits on the Nabati Key doesn't make a lot of sense because Hausman, while Hausman did have a bit of history on, on the Nabati Key, his primary history is associated with, with Indian Key, and it kind of confused the visitors to Lignabadi as to why that was there. So they approached us because it, it made more sense to, to be able to tell a more complete story here at, at our facility. But they definitely approached us. It was awesome. Not to mention, you know, our facility is much more accessible to a broader group of people because, you know, to get out to Lignabadi, you need a, a boat. Um, definitely. So yes, you all will be hearing more about uh, this project in the coming year um, because we're going to be putting together a fundraising campaign to be able to develop the exhibit around this artifact and tell the story and potentially, uh, Brad, I think your plan is to move Indian Key, correct? Because we need to make room for it and make a bigger, more expanded exhibit. So yeah. we've, we've got the artifact, you know, we've, now we've just got to raise the money to do it. Yeah, we've had the, the exhibit designed, and um, and the, and it's a it's a pretty. I mean, we have. I could use like four more of these buildings to do all the things I want to do, for <laughs> for exhibits and, and and to show the history. Um, so downstairs, uh, we're running out of space rapidly. So we're gonna bring the Indian Key model upstairs, where we have a much more open floor space, and we will incorporate the model, um, the uh, the um the the tombstone, plus uh, some other um, standing uh, interpretive panels that will talk more about the history of, of Indian Key, but also the history of Lignum Vitae Key as well. Neat. Yeah, I'm very excited about that project. I'm looking forward to, because we have a design, we worked with our, des our design guys, and it's a really cool looking exhibit. In my, I think, anyway. Were there any first-hand accounts um, written from the survivors on Indian Key uh, after the Indian attack? Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, two of the Hal children, um, oh, sorry, two of the Perrine children, um, Henry Perrine was probably the most noted person. There were seven people killed on the island during the, during the attack. Um, Henry Perrine, probably the most notable, well-known name. Um, while he was killed, his wife and three children did survive the attack. And um, both Hester and 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 um, Henry Jr. both wrote memoirs uh, and gave their first town accounts, which is why we we got a lot of information from uh, you know uh, from from their viewpoint and and what all kind of happened that day. And it's also because of, of Henry Perrine Jr.'s um, account in particular. When he came back, uh, uh, I think it's two decades or you know, 30 years later to visit the island, um, he kind of sketched out on a, and kind of made a map of the island that the best he remembered it and marked where the buildings were and where some of the trees were and, and what kind of trees, uh, you know, lemon trees, papaya and, and um, mulberry bushes. And so that's, that was the kind of the uh, blueprint for how we made our model of of Indian Key. And what's interesting about that is that there are two kinds of cisterns on the island. There are round cisterns and there are square cisterns. And on our model, there are no round cisterns. And sometimes people ask, well, where are the round cisterns? The round cisterns were built post in the aftermath by the military after the attack of 1840. All the square ones were built 
prior, like during the Halvin period and, and, and before that, between the 18, 1825 and 1840. Um, so there are, and then the round sisters were built by the, by the military, uh, 1841, 18, you know, 18, late 1840, 1841 period. So our, our model shows um, how it would have looked prior to the attack with all the buildings still standing. Uh, uh, Brad, I've seen, you know, the, the square cisterns. I have yet to see a round one. And I know that you, on Field Trip Friday a few weeks ago, were up by the round one. But are the round, what kind of material are the round ones built out of? Now, the, on Field Trip Friday, we went up to uh, Key Largo, about, mark, about, mile, about mile marker 98. And there was a round cistern there and a square cistern. And those were kind of house cisterns. Um, the, the round cisterns on Indian Key um, were like 20,000 gallon, very large round cisterns made of brick. And there are, there, there are two large cisterns. Um, the largest is 20,000 gallons. The, there's one slightly smaller. And then another one on the other side of the island which is significantly smaller, but still the same round, um, kind of like the same bricks that you, you see at Fort Jefferson um, uh, or other, you know, kind of, kind of those red bricks that are common from the, in, in the 1840 area, where the, where the square cisterns were built more of the coral rock that was found on the island. And they used a, a mortar called, um, I, I want to say taffy, but that doesn't sound right. Um, it's a kind of mortar that created the, the Bahamians would use by burning um, burning seashells and using the lime that produces to mix with water to create the um, the mortar. Taffy is taffy right? I think taffy is right. No, I think it is. No, it's tabby with a tabby. B. Thank you very much. I'm with a B. Taffy it does, sounds right, but not quite. Yeah, <laughs> tabby. Thank you. <laughs> I have the power of Google at my fingertips. Yeah. <laughs> Most days I can come up with Tabby, but today I could not. All right. Brad, is it yes. true that the Indians or the military, when they came over to Indian Key, fired a cannon from a small boat and that it was in the water in the shallows there at one point? It's true that the Indians fired a cannon, but not the cannon you're referencing. Um, the cannon you're referencing was over on Tea Table Key where there was a small naval depot called Fort Paulding. And during the attack, Fort Paulding had largely been, um, uh, had been um, abandoned. All but only a handful of people were left on the island to care for. It was also a hospital to care for some of the wounded um, soldiers. Uh, and there was a, just a, you know, a, a doctor and a couple of nurses there basically who were, who were fit. And during the attack on the Indian Key, they hurriedly attached two um, these small uh, cannons onto some barges and did not attach them in their hurry uh, very securely onto the barges. And when they fired, the charge was too much and those cannons kind of flipped off of the barge into the shallows. Now on Indian Key, there were several cannons there that had been established for the protection of the island um, that have been placed strategically around, around the island. Now, during the Indian attack, one of the things that made the attack on the Indian Keys so unusual was that was one of the very, the only time during the Seminole War, especially, um, that the Indians took one of those cannons and fired it at the Navy personnel that, that were coming in, in the barges. So they fired one of the cannons that, were, that was already on Indian Key. Margot Ellis, Donna Quincy, Carl Johnson, do you guys have any questions? Kathy Lloyd. Or topics that you'd like to hear more yeah. about, even if it's not a specific question. Hey, hey Brad. Um, yes. I just have a quick question. Um, my husband's grandfather built a big house in Quincy Harbor, my mom for 74, back in the late 50s. And the family has heard that that little house was rented out to the CIA during the Bay of Pigs crisis. And 
we've been told there's articles about the little pink house on Lower Matacumbe, and we just didn't know if anyone, I've been trying to find the magazine articles. Um, I didn't know if anyone at the Florida Keys History Center might know anything about that. Yeah, you, we taught, we, you, con she, Kathy Lloyd contacted me um, several, a couple, like two weeks ago, I'm going to say, and th this house that was rented out, you know, the story is that to the CIA during, I, I imagine the Cuban Missile Crisis, I'm not positive. I don't have, I've not come across anything yet, but that's definitely one of those stories that's on my radar. And it, when something, which in, in very, invariably it will, crops up, um, I, will, I will definitely jump on that and dig deeper in, in, into that story. And that's one of the things that um, once we get back to normal here at the Keys History Discovery Center, and I'll, I'll, I'll be more able to kind of uh, delve into some of the other stories that have been kind of put on hold as we've, you know, been working on this, all, all, all these virtual presentations. Um, but that's a, it's a great, uh, it's, it's a great piece of history and something I'm looking forward to getting into. I just have not been able to, uh, to dig, do much digging yet, but that's, I, I will definitely um, reach back out to you should I uh, uncover something. And if you do, please contact me again. Okay, thank you. And I really enjoy your lectures, by the way. These are very informative. Thank you thank so you. much. I, I appreciate thank it. You. Thank you. Hey, Brad, how far back do our newspaper archives go um, that are in there in the library with you? Do any of them go back to the 60s? We have, um, when the keynoter and the reporter, uh, two local newspapers kind of went out of, went all digital, um, Rather than all the hardbound copies going to Miami and kind of not being accessible to our to the locals, um, that we were contacted and asked if we would house all of all of our um, all of these bound copies. And the keynoter dates back to the 70s. I know we have like a 63, 6, 1963, I think 1964, 1965 edition. So there might be something in those. In, in those that, that might have some information in it. And that'll just be, you know, taking time, opening them up and kind of going through them, which is dangerous because there's so much cool stuff in there. And we, and, and they're, they're like 200 or so of these books. I mean, and it's every edition of the keynoter and the reporter. And um, they're, it's, they're, they're fantastic things to sit and just kind of get lost. I think Aaron's gonna come in and kind of dig one out. <laughs> And there's there's so many great stories in there, but it's just gonna take they're on the bottom behind the behind the table. Yeah. Um but they're but they're that's gonna take some time just to kind of kinda of go through. Because they are uh, yeah, and and people can definitely come in and 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 look at these. Um and people do, and it's like looking up I think Aaron looked up her hello, Aaron looked up her uh her birth. Her birth announcement in these, and um, there are some great, great. I mean, it's great old history. It, it, this might be a really good resource, Kathy, for us to, uh, to, you know, spend some time, page, you know, flipping the pages through. But the, but it's, you know, it, the problem is you get in here, start opening them up, and then you just kind of get lost, and hours go by, and suddenly, you know, it's it's, it's one of the funner things to do in, in our, in our library here. And people can, anyone can come, make an appointment to come, to come look through this stuff, which is really cool. So Kathy, if you have a, any kind of date to work with, would be really helpful. Um, um, all that we know, Alan. It's yeah. my husband, Alan. <laughs> it's right. his grandfather. Yeah, no, um, all I remember was whenever I was a kid, we were watching the news down in Davie, and our house came up on the news of people sitting at the picnic table by the water and said, this is the location where some of the Bay of Pigs operation was, you know, out of. And the people that rented the house for my grandfather were uh, surveyors of the Gulf, map surveyors. But they had quite a few larger boats out in front of the house that couldn't get up to the house, and quite a few smaller boats that the service 
But apparently it turned out down the road that they were a big part of the Bay of Pigs operation. That's all I know. That makes a lot of sense because there was I know the CIA operated at more from more than from out of more than one location here in the Florida Keys. Um, I believe I believe Lindemans Key up in North Key Lar in, in Northern Keys, above Key Largo, kind of in the Key Biscayne area, was also home to uh, some CIA some CIA operations. Do you have any idea of 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 any ballpark figure of, of, of the year that, that you can recall from that? Uh, yeah, that, that yeah, good, good, yeah, that'd be easy. Well, I, I'll look up Bay of Pigs and start from there. That that'd be much easier. <laughs> I can do that. The the neighbor the neighbor next door is was a military man. He said these are definitely he thought military. They rented them. Yeah, it was Colonel Sheffield. Oh, excellent. Yeah. Well, I'll look up Bay of Pigs and find out what, when that year was, and then we can kind of have a place to start from, and um, and see if there's any any mention in the local papers about that. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Uh, I think the magazine article that um, we do have a contact in Miami. He's um, he's been a friend of ours for 20 years. I just need to reach out to him because he says he knows where the article was about. Oh, the cool. Little pink, house, little pink house. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. Yeah, well, thank you. Fantastic. All right. Anybody else? Uh, this isn't history related, but I'm just wondering now that the keys have opened up, how are you guys doing down there? Have you been inundated? Well, um, it's traffic has definitely increased. You can definitely tell there's, there's more traffic. That's for sure. Um, it was lovely, you know, for a couple months to be able to drive up and down the highway and, and you know, a lot of times not see anybody in front of you. Um, we are going to be opening up next week, I believe, um, or the week after, and shortly after in the weeks to come. Um, so we're looking forward to, you know, welcoming those people, you know, but there's definitely been an influx. You can definitely see there's an influx of people. Uh, lots of fishing charters going out, you know, bigger, you know, more people, more traffic. Um, wave runners. Wave, yeah, wave runners. Um, <laughs> a little more, a little more siren action at, at night on on US on US one. But um, I haven't, I, I don't, I can't speak for Jill and Aaron so much. I, you know, love working from home, which I, I do largely, and I don't get out in the public very much. Um, so, I. Uh, I have not been, personally, I've not been, you know, I've not experienced much change. Karen, did you have something to say? No. <laughs> okay. No, I mean, I miss not being able to get from the mile marker 92 to here at work in 13 minutes, yeah. like I was able to do for... <laughs> the past 10 weeks you definitely can't do that anymore you have to wait to pull back out on the highway um, but I, I I've been or, I've been doing delivery for all my groceries and you know with my grandfather in our family unit at 91 we've been extremely cautious on our exposure so I haven't been out in a public you know retail place in weeks so I have no idea the only place I go is a grocery store and I have not I, I won't go on the weekend because it's too crazy, but uh, it hasn't been, I've not seen the big crowds there at all. I'm sure on Saturday and Sunday, Friday and Saturday and Sunday, it's a different story, especially as more, pe more and more people come down. But Lord knows lots of trailers and lots of boats coming down the highway. And as far as yeah. our reopening plans here go, we are targeting, we've still got a, a couple of pieces of the puzzle that are, um, in flux, some, you know, protective plexiglass and things like that that are on order that we want to make sure actually arrive when they say they're going to arrive and we get them installed. Um, because, of course, you know, the safety of our volunteer docents and our guests is our um, driving um, factor here. But if all goes according to plan, we would like to open back up to the general public on Wednesday, June 17th. So, like I said, we've still got a couple of pieces of the puzzle to put together to be able to make that happen. 
you know, trying to get hand sanitizer and disinfecting wipes and, and all of that lined up is all a part of it. Um, and we hope to do a couple of days of a soft opening um, just for our members. So um, that would be the week prior if we're able to put all of that together. But we'll be sending out um, an email with a more formal announcement here. Um, hopefully, hopefully by the end of the week, we'll be able to nail all that down. In the days to come. And we'll of course be, um, you know, restricted capacity, um, no touchscreen monitors, um, you know, all of those sort of modifications that are required of us right now. So it won't be exactly the same, but we'll be excited to be able to get people back in here and enjoying our exhibits. There's still a ton, a ton of information, you know, to a ton of pictures and, and artifacts and things to experience and see. So we're looking forward to, um, the, this has been interesting, all this virtual stuff that we've been doing. It, it's been fun and interesting, but it'll be nice to uh, have people, you know, come in and not just rely on me talking about it, but pe people to see these things firsthand. I think our fish miss, miss people. <laughs> like I had to, one day I was here getting something and my daughter was with me and she came in and of course she goes right to the aquarium um, and all the fish just like rushed up to her at the glass. I think like, oh, there's somebody here to see us. Because <laughs> right now all they see is Blake, you know, he keeps up with all of their um, feeding and care and cleaning and all of that, but uh, I, I think they're excited to have Kit in there. <laughs> or it could just been Violet. <laughs> um, I just want to say I really appreciate the, the hard work that the four staff members and the time and effort that they've put in. It's it's been just wonderful and that we're, you know, you're able to share all of this with, with so many people. So thanks again for all of your hard work and your efforts. Thank you, Ellen. Well, and Ellen, what I love about this most is that, you know, so many of our members like yourself um, do spend part of the year away from the Keys. So I'm thrilled that we're able to still engage with you and you're up in Wisconsin and Mary Jo said she's in New Jersey and, you know, as our, mem our, <laughs> as our members, you know, travel to other places and spend time, you know, at other places, we're able to stay connected with you all. Um, and that's been kind of the silver lining and I think the good that has kind of come out of this situation. This, this virtual element is something we'd had kind of in the back of our minds as something we would want to do in the future, um, but it was kind of a daunting task to put together all the equipment and infrastructure and all that, but this situation kind of forced us to take that leap and there's no going back now. <laughs> yep, a, a lot of these programs will continue. You know, we'll, we'll continue doing this and the community views and the field trip Fridays where we go out in the community to different historic locations and talk about those. We'll con this is just going to broaden, you know, it's going to be an addition to what we've already been offering and we'll have the museum proper itself you know, where people can come in and but we'll also have a lot of, a lot of um, virtual offerings still. And our existing a schedule of like the virtual visits and um, that'll change a little bit just because, you know, when we reopen, um, you know, we can't be doing a live segment with folks in here. So we'll have to adjust that schedule a little bit, um, but we'll still be doing, you know, weekly virtual visits and the field trips like Brad said and um, keep all of that good stuff coming your way. Because we love doing it. I love talking about history, so it's, it's, it's awesome for me. All right, well, let's, uh, if, if, does anybody else have any more questions? Or if not, we're going to go ahead and wrap up this um, edition of Cocktails with a Curator, or Beer with a Curator, as the case may be. Thank you so much. Thank you. This is fun. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks, everyone, thank for joining us. And we will see you. Uh, We'll be back Thursday, tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock for another edition of our uh, exploration of, of, of the uh, facility. And then on Field Trip Fridays, we're going to talk about all those uh, bridge piers that are some people refer to as the coffins that are visible out in the water from the Channel 2 Bridge off the lower Matacumbi Key. We'll 
talk about that a little bit. Hey, and we added another lecture to the June schedule. Um, so hopefully you all saw that in your email that went out on Monday. Um, but the link to register is up on our website, and that's what that's where I'm going to be next Wednesday evening. So hopefully you all will join us for that uh, virtual lecture as well. Hi, Alan and Brad. When is the coffin talk? What, what day, when is that tomorrow morning? Uh, that, that, that'll be a part of our field trip Fridays. Okay. Um, it's be at 10 o'clock on Friday morning. Every Friday we go to a different historic location around the Upper Keys. And um, we're going to be out at on Lower Matacumbi Key looking out at those, uh, those, those coffin looking uh, concrete structures out in the water. Um, so that'll be 10 o'clock on, on Friday morning. And Great. Kathy, we, we stream that live from our Facebook page. Awesome. Perfect. Thank you. And we'll also be available from our YouTube channel as well. It, unless we get rained out, which hopefully won't happen. Yes. So how, so how do we get to, um, uh, how do we get into Facebook Friday through YouTube? You can just go to our, to, to our Facebook page at 10 o'clock and watch it live. Um, oh, okay. Or from, or, the, or it, it'll still be there for, for the rest, you know, for, for a long time. Or you can go to uh, YouTube and type in Keys History and Discovery Center and all of our virtual offerings, the lectures, the community views, the virtual visits with Blake, with, with myself, even one with, 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 um, with uh, Aaron and Violet, as well as um, <laughs> these talks are all available there. We have like, like 30 or 40 offerings on, that, on our channel right now. Don, you had a question? That was the answer to my question. All right. I wanted to know, can we watch it later? Absolutely. Great. Yeah, our Thank YouTube you. channel is up for, up for good now, and we'll just continue to add to that. I'm going to be spending the summer in Minneapolis, Minnesota, and I'll continue to watch you even from up there. You can binge watch, binge watch the Keys History Discovery YouTube channel. Okay. <laughs> Thank right. you. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you. All right. Have a good night. Bye-bye. Good night. <laughs>